Okay. Um, so, over the course of several months in 1967, um, the artists Neil Taroni, Michel Parmentier, Oliver Mosse, and Daniel Buren, I, I just English him, I'm sorry, um, collaborated on a series of exhibitions, or as they put it, manifestations, each of which was accompanied by a published statement. The first two of these manifestations are undoubtedly the best known, particularly since they appear to constitute a single event. On January 3rd, 1967, the four artists, and they are sort of left to right in this slide, Parmentier, Buren, uh, Mosse in the back, Taroni in the front, um, arrived at the Salon de la Jeune Peinture, and in front of a large banner bearing their last names, proceeded to each make works that were briefly hung beneath that banner before they were taken down and the banner supplemented with the further phrase nexpos pa are not showing. Um, the making of the work constituted the first manifestation and the removal of it was the second manifestation. In translation, the manifesto distributed in relation to their initial appearance read reads as follows. Since to paint is a game, since to paint is to harmonize or disharmonize color, since to paint is to apply consciously or not rules of composition, since to paint is to valorize gesture, since to paint is to represent something external or interpret it or appropriate, appropriate it or contest or present it, since to paint is to propose a springboard for the imagination, since to paint is to illustrate an interiority, since to paint is a justification, since to paint is to serve a purpose, since to paint is to paint according to aestheticism, flowers, women, eroticism, the daily round, art, data, psychoanalysis, the Vietnam War, then in capital letters, we are not painters. The strategy of that statement is hardly novel. It presents itself as an all-out assault on painting, while in fact function to foreground the specific differences that define the paintings the artist made and so briefly hung. They do not do any of those things that painting is said to do. They don't harmonize colors, they don't valorize gesture, they don't illustrate interiority, they don't serve any purpose, and so on. And yet, here they are, paintings nonetheless. Its particular cadences, as well as its development through negation, may well call to mind Beckett's, there is nothing to express, nothing with which to express, nothing from which to express, no power to express, no desire to express, together with the obligation to express. And if that resonance is alive for you, this statement obviously reads rather differently than when it isn't. The works so briefly shown and then removed each followed a fixed format that carried through the entire uh, series of manifestations. I seem to have got my slides a little bit messed up here. Let me go back. Oh, it's not letting me go back. Um, each followed a fixed format that carried through the entire series of, of, of manifestations. Parmentier painted a series of broad horizontal bands. And in the actual slide I had up at a moment ago, it's a little hard to tell whether at the time he was still using masking tape to delineate the bands or it started the folding that became his, his ongoing practice. Um, Taroni covered his canvas with brush imprints of a specified size at specified intervals. Mosse placed a perfect circle in the center of his canvas. And Buren painted one or more uncolored stripes of vertically striped canvas white. The second manifestation, that is their withdrawal from the salon, had its own manifesto, a letter against salons. Like since painting, it offered a list of reasons for their refusal to participate in all Parisian salons or with any painters who do participate in them. And you know, because salons are a heritage from the 19th century, because they're extensions of the entertainment business, because they show painting, which until, I'm quoting them, until some proof to the contrary, is inherently objectively reactionary, and so on. It's perhaps interesting that this letter uses Parska because, 
whereas the earlier statement uses puisque since. Um, in French, as in English, that since carries a sort of temporal connotation that the parska doesn't. So it, it gives that opening statement, since, 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 a kind of statement of the moment, right? um, as if announcing something new. And that's absent from the Salon letter, which is clearly and pretty exclusively the taking of a position in the present. The statement issued towards the end of the third manifestation, which this slide is showing you, um, and this was a kind of timed performance. It was held in the auditorium of the Museum of the Decorative Arts in June of 1967, and the audience was invited to come in and sit. And then towards the end, about 15 minutes from the end of, of the time, this statement uh, on the right here was distributed, which reads, it was evidently only, it was, again, a kind of interesting tense to it. It was evidently only a question of looking at the canvases of Buren, Mosse, Parmentier, Taroni. What's to be seen is a canvas two and a half meters by two and a half meters divided into 29 equal vertical bands, red and white, the two outermost which, of which are covered in white, Buren. A black circle in the center of a white canvas, Mosse. Alternating horizontal gray and white bands measuring 0.38 meters by 2.5 meters on a canvas 2.5 meters square. The seventh and last partial band measures 0.22 meters by 2.5 meters par manchier. 85 blue impressions of a flat number 50 brush at 30 centimeter intervals on a white surface 2.5 meters square. Toroni. A fourth, rather more complex manifestation, with the addition of spotlights, a film loop, and audio track, took place in September at the fifth Paris Biennial. Um, there, both the installation and, and the a detail of what's, what's on that funny shape in the front. And then the group, if that's what it was, and they have all individually express great resentment as being described as the group BMPT. They prefer simply this consecutive listing of their names. In any case, whatever they were, group or not, it then fell apart when Parmanche refused to agree to the proposal that for the next manifestation, each artist would make the other's works. His grounds were that this would conflate issues of signature and individuality that were in fact crucially distinct from each other. Um, you might think that Manifestation 4, putting their faces and their paintings in this, together in this close conjunction, is moving right up to that edge. It's making that next proposal seem inevitable. And yet Parmanche thinks that's, as it were, a step too far. Right? Um, Buran initially sided with Mosse and Taroni. Um, this is the next manifestation, just the three of them. <coughs> And on the right, for those of you who care about connoisseurial things, that's Buren's Mosse. Um, shows up, as it shows up now in, in Buren's catalog. Um, so Buren initially sided with Mosse and Taroni, and eventually, fairly quickly actually, came around to Panamache's view that this was all a betrayal and a mistake. Now this whole sequence of developments over the course of 1967 is, from the perspective of, let's say, the US at this time, all pretty strange. By then, we believed, or most advanced art anyway believed, that we were beyond the avant-gardism of manifestos, internal dissent, fracturing groups, and all that kind of thing, and mostly believed as well that we were well beyond this kind of worrying about painting at all. Right? It just was not where any of the action was. Um, so it takes a bit of work to try and figure out what was serious in this. Um, at the time, it would have. Um, and certainly, artists in the US in general were not in a particularly good position to make sense of this conjuncture and its various consequences. From December 67, the four artists went their own individual way. Taroni continued to apply his brush strokes to pretty much any surface offered to him and became a regular and significant figure 
on the circuits of conceptual art. Say went on to make paintings um, broadly characterizable as a form of geometric abstraction. The O, which in retrospect he was the one who proposed that that troublesome manifestation, looks like it was probably always his initial to start with. Right? He had his signature at stake in the work in a funny way from the beginning. Um, and it continues you can see, to play a prominent but not exclusive role in his later work. Parmentier continued um, to make folded, banded paintings, but at very irregular intervals over the course of a, a difficult and really deeply interesting career. He stops painting in the late 60s and simply vanishes for a long time before he comes back and starts working again. Um, he's a very interesting painter. Um, <coughs> And Buren becomes, I think, an interesting case, the one I want to, to stay with. Um, until several um, years ago, and it's more than several now, about a decade ago, um, his practice remained essentially unchanged. It was always a matter of a stripe surface, stripe paint applied to it, something done with it. But the stripes quickly become very mobile. Um, here you see them in several moments in just 1968, I mean, immediately after his participation in these things. Um, at the same time, he did continue for a long time to make at least one thing he was willing to call a painting every year. Um, that is, one work that was mounted on a stretcher and was typically shown by being leaned against a wall. They are not normally hung. As a first approximation, it seems fair enough to say that the contrast between Tironi's embrace of a certain conceptualism and Mosse's return to a more or less orthodox practice of painting reflects the breaking apart of attention the four of them were trying to hold together. It also seems fair to say that Mosse and Parmanche continue to be sort of bound to each other by their continuing interest in holding that tension together in very different ways. Um, Buren has certainly become by far the best known and most highly recognizable of these four artists. And what's standardly said of him, um, and now I'm just going to read you a made up quote that I think you can find bits and pieces of all over the place. Something like, since the late 1960s, the French conceptualist Daniel Buren has engaged in an ongoing work of institutional critique by placing his signature ready-made stripes in a wide variety of sites and situations integrally associated with the display of art. And here would be a, an early instance of that um, very well-known piece where invited to show at the Gallery Apollinaire, he places his stripes in the doors and window on the outside of the gallery, and there is nothing within accessible or to be seen. Now it seems to me this description is pretty much word by word wrong. That is to say the recognitions that it's woven out of, which are clear enough when you look at something like this, um, have very, very little to do with Buren's work. Don't help in seeing it. Don't help in assessing its weight, its purchase on our interest, and so on. And of course, the point, I hope, is that it doesn't feel like that. It seems like it tells us exactly what the weight of the work is. The weight of the work lies in a certain institutional critique. Um, and it seems to tell us also why, why, it, why it exerts no particular demand on our seeing it. It's conceptual work. Its means are ready-made. Such an understanding takes Buren's work and activity to be something closely akin to placing his name on the various walls and pedestals, plazas and streets and buildings that have drawn his interest, so that seeing his work amounts to seeing that name, which in turn amounts to seeing him pointing out this or that institution or situation. Right? He's putting a little tag on these things. And it's this pointing that we recognize as a work of institutional critique. It'll seem natural to refer to the particular things Buren makes, the particular ways he does this pointing, 
as so many gestures, a word whose insistence within this tissue of recognitions I think is worth noting. The thought that one kind, at least, of modern artist performs gestures, as opposed presumably to making works on the one hand and engaging in actions on the other, is one that has really been with us since Duchamp. It's part of the way we're used to handling a work like Fountain. We call it a gesture. Buren's hostility to Duchamp has been, from the very beginning of his career, pretty much unremitting. He has no time whatsoever for Duchamp. The alternative, particularly in his early writings, and this will no doubt seem really bottomlessly French of him, is Cezanne. That's somebody Buren thinks well of. This is obviously linked to Buren's habit of referring to his work as painting and to the way in which the important early essay, Critical Limits, locates things like the ready-made among what he calls canceling discourses, which are opposed to his practice and to practices like collage, which he also thinks favorably of and thinks to be very closely related to his own practice. Here it's probably worth noting that Buren's early work, these are pieces from 66, um, Buren used to say that all his work before the manifestations had been destroyed. That turns out not to be true, and he's slowly letting it leach back into his catalog and so on and showing it from time to time. Um, his early work is clearly related to practices of collage or more accurately decollage, um, sort of stripping away of things that are on top of other things. Um, strongly influenced by the sort of poster work, the affichiste work of people like Jacques Villegle in France. Um, the other early influence that Buren is willing to cite is that of Simon Antai, um, and that's a reference that in many ways becomes de rigueur for French painters in the 70s and 80s. Antai is the figure everybody looks to, but in Buren's case, it's also fully meant. Um, and, and he makes that clear in an essay he writes for Hantai's recent retrospective at the Pompidou. This is work from 64, 65. Um, it's made by Hantai's crumpling up a canvas, painting on the outside of that crumpled ball, and then unfolding it. Um, so you can see already that Parmentier is also someone who is looking at Hantai a lot during this time. It seems to me the word signature does particularly notable work in holding together the cluster of recognitions I'm exploring. I've already noted its role in putting an end to the early shared manifestations. In response to Mose's proposal that each member make the other's works, Parmonte argued that this would create a problem of signature that would supplant and obscure what he take, took and Buren came to take as the core commitment to the impersonality of painting. It took Buren some time to fully absorb the weight of Parmentier's critique, um, and that no doubt shows something about what is repeatedly tempting to Buren in, as his work unfolds. But in the end, he does embrace it. On this view, the stripes, Parmentier's band, Buren's stripes, are impersonal, irreducibly individual, but raise no question about the maker's hand or person. They don't go through to a problem of the author, the signature. Um, so if the words conceptual, conceptualist, signature, and ready-made are all out of place in describing Buren's work, what are we to make of the claim to critique they presumably help motivate and make sense of? What do we imagine this critique amounts to? Do we really need, this is a piece on the steps of the Art Institute in Chicago, do we really need Daniel Buren to point out that this is a museum, that that's a pedestal? How could have we have thought that doing this, um, this is a piece partly inside and going out the window of the John Weber Gallery in Soho, um, how could we imagine that that amounts to anything worth calling institutional critique? These questions are, as it were, willfully 
naive. And I think it's worth remarking that institutional critique, as we've mostly known it, tends to force that willful naivety on one. An installation by Hans Hacke. Um, this is um, extended detailing of the, whole, the real estate holdings of one of the Guggenheim's trustees in Manhattan in the neighborhood where artists are living. Right? So, um, this may appear, appear much fuller than a Buren piece, and so to impart something more like real news about real estate, power, wealth, museums, artists, no money, so on. Um, a piece by Michael Asher may appear, to, may appear to count as an intervention in certain kinds of institutional fact, say the relation of students and faculty at CalArts, famous piece he did, um, or into the hidden and obscured commerce of the gallery. Here at the, the Claire Copley Gallery, he simply removed the wall that divides the office from the gallery space. Um, but the risk these pieces run, and to which they all too often succumb, is that behind what is in fact somewhat less than news and doesn't quite manage to amount to an action, such work finally offers nothing more than, as Jeremy Gilbert Rolfe extremely acidly puts it, self-congratulation, exhibiting or encouraging its audience to believe in the superior, superiority of the consciousness which it seeks to articulate, and as it were, be. Right? So we feel that something political has happened here, that we have taken account of something. In the face of such compromised and unpleasantly complicitous sophistication, only a certain naivete will do, particularly if we want to recover whatever actual force such work may have. Calling the pointing out of, say, a museum an act of institutional critique seems to assume that we didn't, in fact, know that it was a museum, or since that seems highly unlikely, we didn't know it the right way. But the only guide to the right way the formulation lets us imagine is the simple pointing out. And so we're driven back on some variation of the idea that we didn't know it was a museum. Most likely, if we want to stay within the terms on offer, we'll find ourselves trying to say something about how we knew it was a museum, but we didn't know it was sufficient explicitness. So that the ultimate gain from the institutional critic's activity is that we become aware of ourselves in some special way. One way we might be tempted to put this is to say that we've been given an experience of, I guess, the museum, the gallery, where in some sense previously we didn't have one. That last way of phrasing the matter might finally seem to hold a certain satisfaction. We've won our way through to a place from which we can see that Buren's work is suitably continuous with what we expect of art more generally, that it give us an experience. That position should strike you as familiar. It's the position first explicitly laid out by what we call minimalism. As Robert Morris put it, the better new work is in some way more reflexive because one's awareness of oneself existing in the same space is stronger than in previous work with its many internal relationships. One is more aware than before that he himself is establishing relationships as he apprehends the object. Something like that is what institutional critique does as well. The questions that start here and find one culmination in a certain appeal to institutional critique will continue to run throughout these lectures. But for the moment, I just want to stay with the smaller and presumably much simpler question of what Buren's work might actually amount to. So I begin again now with the thought that there might, after all, be something actually to be seen in Buren's work. It certainly wouldn't be much. It's simply the white painting of one or more of the uncolored sections of a striped support that is the primary vehicle of his work. Because it's white on white, it's not always that easy to see, although it can stand out more or less depending on the support. And noticing that it is, in fact, there doesn't produce produce much in the way of a sort of aesthetic frisson. It's just sort of featurelessly there and hard to dignify even with the kinds of talks about suppression of the gesture that might count interestingly 
in some other body of work. It seems, it seems as if it wouldn't be too hard to get some kind of line of talk about non-composition going on around this, but it's fairly hard to see where that could productively go. It's not arbitrary enough to, say, engage chance. It's not systematic enough to generate the kinds of seriality we sometimes expect from things like this. It's not phenomenologically active enough to tilt one towards invocations of something like grace or intuition. It's just there and doesn't really seem to do anything except qualify the work in question as painting. That's pretty much all Buren has done is he's put some paint on the thing. Presumably, that is the point. That Buren's activity is first and foremost painting, and Buren's career is an exploration of just that, painting in some version of its most reduced form. In particular, in the form in which painting just is the covering of a support with pigment. Covered is the word Buren uses in the description of his contribution to the third manifestation. It's interesting that the others all manage to describe their work without using any verb at all. You'd say Buren needs that verb. He needs the fact that what he's showing you is covering. Um, any movement in Buren's career, and there is a lot of it, would evidently be a consequence of this commitment to this particular practice of painting. So how would it go to look at his work that way? In 1964 and 65, Buren was making a fair number of abstract paintings featuring large, roughly bounded areas of fairly thick, unmodulated paint, as well as a range of work that drew on or imitated some mixture of collage and decollage, like this. I, I didn't put up some of the gloopier painterly abstractions. Um, sometimes he was working on a blank canvas. Sometimes he was working on one already striped. What holds all of this work together, if anything, and it's clearly someone in some ways casting about, he's up to very different things, is evidently a question about or a sense for the actual work of painting as a matter of one thing covering or uncovering another. The work he begins making in 1966 has this as pretty much its only fact. That's all that he takes out of that period. Covering an uncolored stripe with white, Buren makes visible a relationship between material depth, one thing on top of another, and edge or limit, a relation that once stated carries through the whole of his work. Paint on canvas, canvas on stretcher, <coughs> stretcher on wall, with every relationship in depth answered by its limit, thus opening up a whole series of problems and prospects as covering and uncovering turns through recto and verso, work and support, Painting is act and painting is object. Buren borrows from Louis Althusser the, term theoret Althusser the term theoretical object to describe what he now has, this machine for generating a relationship between material depth and limits. In January 1971, he showed a number of paintings, acrylic on striped canvas, at the Paris Gallery of Yvonne Lambert, and for that occasion, he wrote an essay entitled Critical Limits um, that proposed a view of his work that really laid down the path it would then follow. He polemicizes in it against a wide range of emergent alternative practices, including minimalist objecthood, the ready-made, post-Duchampian conceptualism, and what he refers to as land art and happenings. He's against all that stuff. Um, the text goes on to elaborate, elaborate how, by virtue of the limits that define it, painting opens beyond itself and onto a field it inevitably reveals as both relational and contingent. Exposed to, and so capable of exposing, the institutional and cultural limits within which it claims its presence. The essay is punctuated by three fairly opaque diagrams that are meant to show how one passes from art as it has been perceived through its actual material condition to a reconfigured critical practice. The diagrams, of course, don't lay out, in fact, a view of art, although you'll notice that's the subject Buren moves, uses all the way through, but a view exclusively of painting. 
The various nested squares are essentially pictures of painting, of the relations obtaining between stretcher, canvas, museum, and culture, with the hatching meant to indicate what covers what. As I've said, these diagrams are far from transparent, and I don't think there's a lot to be gained tonight by trying to work through Buren's quite extended commentary on them. And I don't expect that simply looking at them, you go, oh, so that's it. Right? Um, that opacity itself is kind of interesting. I think it's one indication that they represent not so much the worked out theoretical preconditions for Buren's practice, but a kind of effect and reflexive extension of it. Um, it may have struck you already that simply taken as pictorial exercises, these diagrams are not without a certain relation to the work Buren is actually making at the time. Um, and they may well seem, this just struck me um, as I was working on this, they may well seem to predict what eventually, very late in his career, becomes a turn to matters of light, color, and transparency almost exclusively. And I'd say, in some sense, that's already being sounded out a little bit here. In any case, they are, as he puts it, a demonstration or a presentation of his work and not a theory of it. And that's the general position he'll claim for the vast mass of writings that proceed to accompany his work over the years. Almost every time he makes work, he then produces a writing of some kind in relation to it. It seems to me with the statement developed through these diagrams, Buren's practice is free in principle to move into the much expanded field that it occupied so prominently over the bulk of his career. It moves into this territory the same way it always moves through a work of methodical, non-tautological repetition, which includes among its effects a continual work of revision within Buren's writing. By 1980, it's brought him to the point of wanting to republish a much work, worked over text from 1960, from 10 years earlier, um, systematically replacing the various words that he's been using for work. And he used both oeuvre, the more artistic word, and travail, the more labor word, to replace them both with the word visual tool. And that presumably marks an important turning in his relation to both art and painting. And it perhaps particularly, I think, marks a new explicitness in a relation to architecture that has obviously always been there, but has now become fully explicit in some way for him. <coughs> this shift in vocabulary entails no slackening of Buren's insistence on the specific visuality of the work, nor any definitive surrender of either the practice of or reference to painting. It's notable that even six years after making this change in his review of the Pompidou Center's major Pollock retrospective, and that, that Buren was at this point interested in reviewing a Pollock retrospective at the Pompidou is, is by itself a fact worth noticing. Um, and he uses it to level a certain critique at the Pompidou. And it is interesting that critique is keyed absolutely to the particular incapacity of that museum to show this work. Um, the essay is entitled, and, and the question that really drives it is, painting and its exhibition. Is painting presentable? So that's, again, where he comes down. It's entirely continuous with his earliest preoccupations. <clears throat> Buren's writings, in general, are not particularly rich with references to other writers and theorists. Um, the reference to Althusser is fairly standard in a considerable range of French art of the late 60s and early 70s. Um, and it's closely linked to a line taken up from Harold Rosenberg by such figures as Marcelin Plane, the leading critic associated with the journal Tel Kel and the group Support Surface, as well as the art historian and critic Hubert Darmiche, who went on to become one of the founding figures of the short-lived but very influential journal Macula. The phrase is paint thinks. Plane is inclined to link this formulation to Marx, as does Rosenberg himself. Um, and I'm unsurprisingly going to want to underline its Hegelian roots. Paint thinks because art is a, a sustained episode within the history of thought. We can work our way around to this same point along a slightly different path 
that also usefully brings out something of the variety and interest of Buren's writings. And here I want to start from a piece that he made three times between 1975 and 1980, and has since repeated several more times, I think most recently, I may be wrong about this, at Gracemere, um, on two of the early occasions that it evoked, in, evoked some of his really best writing. What the piece usually adds to our account of Buren is an explicitness about repetition, implicit from the very beginning in his painting a white stripe on white, but then further unfolded as the structure of his practice itself, and here registered within the movement of the piece itself. Its first appearance was on the Wannsee outside Berlin, and then ended up, at least for that moment, in the gallery at the Academie der Kunst. On the lake, it was nine sails, made of Buren's standard striped fabric with the outermost bands painted white. And I think you can see the sort of graying of, of the bands he's painted. Um, the boats to which they were attached participated in a regatta, where their order of finish determined the sequence of their subsequent placement left to right on the walls of the museum. The occasion produced from Buren a quite beautiful and very richly punned text, and I would have to go back and forth between French and English to bring that out to you, which I'm not going to try and do. But you would say punning is, is already words covering and uncovering themselves through one another. And this text plays on what the various moments of voile, sail, toile, canvas, right, cloth and sail, veil and unveil, voile and dévoile. These same sail, veil, canvases were subsequently raced on Lake Geneva and installed differently at Geneva's art museum, with Buren's catalog essay now focusing on the relations between recto and verso and the viewer's position before or behind the work. And then they were raced um, and installed again in 1980 at Lucerne. Um, you see that? here, um, and, and um, this time gave rise to an essay that I will quote from. It's as beautiful and surprising in many ways as the first essay, in which now the opening meditation on veiling and sailing paint and cloth, on what it captures and fails to capture, becomes a thought about mirroring in memory, the time of repetition in a work, the time that in its repetition carries these objects in and out of the work, their work, the nine sails, the new sails, the new regard, again, puns in French holding this together. He says, these comings and goings are the rules of the game, a rule that transgresses the law that would have the work permanently immobilize itself in a state only the new gaze of the beholder could renew. Here the rule implies that to the new regard of the beholder is joined the presence, always new and actual and ready to disappear, of the work. If to the contrary the rule of the game were not applied, we would have, in some place or other, nine flags, relics of a battle definitively lost, like that of painting. But here the rule says there is again an instance. And this signifies that if the rule is familiar, the outcome of the game, continually making and unmaking itself, is unforeseeable. In many ways, this piece returns to an earlier essay, It Rains, It Snows, It Paints, where the reference to Althusser is crucially inflected by a citation of Maurice Blanchot that goes to the heart of the impersonality Buren takes to be essential to his work. Um, before I read the quote, I just want to remember, again, this is, this is a, a passage that is hard to read in translation. There's a lot of room for maneuver in trying to translate this. And I have, in fact, picked my way between the uncredited translation as it appears in Buren's, in, as it appeared in Arts Magazine, and the standard translation of the Blanchot passage that it mostly quotes. Uh, so. Right. begins in Buren's voice and very quickly turns into Blanchot's. Why, therefore, at the moment at which art disappears, where it is no longer justifiable, and now we start quoting Blanchot, 
Does it appear for the first time as an inquiry in which something essential is at stake, where what counts is not the artist, nor the state of the artist's soul, nor the close approach to the human, nor the act of labor, nor any of the values on which the world is built, nor those other values upon which the beyond once opened, an inquiry that is nonetheless precise and rigorous, demanding that it eventuate as a work, a work that would be and nothing more. Certainly worth noticing how the rhythms of that fall in with the rhythms of the initial statement we started from. The essay ends with this paragraph. The impersonality or anonymity of the work places us in front of a fact or thought which can only state itself outside any metaphysics, like rain or like snow. We can thus say, for the first time, that it paints just as it rains. However, when it rains and when it snows, we are faced with a natural phenomenon. When it paints, we are faced with an historical fact. With this, I think, I've come full circle back to the core propositions and internal debates of the 1967 manifestations. The it that emerges as the subject of painting is the practice at once individual and impersonal that Parmentier was concerned not to reduce to a matter of signature, um, as it has been fleshed out by Buren's subsequent work and ongoing re reflection. My suggestion so far has been that this practice is usefully seen in the context of Hegel's claim that art emerges as a sustained moment within a larger history of thought, and that this can help us make sense of the way in which Althusser and Planchot can cohabit within Buren's writings. I want now to work a bit more closely with that last point with a view to taking up again the questions about institutional critique that are still hovering in the background. So first, we're going to get some schematic Hegel, enough to get us launched and maybe enough to serve for some of the future lectures as well. The claim that art thinks is continuous with the larger Hegelian claim that dialectic is not a method but is the simple consequence of attending to our objects in their unfolding, their proving or disproving. Art's Hegelian autonomy, that is, its capacity to be the subject and bearer of a history, is tightly linked to the necessity of its thinking. And what it thinks above all is thought's capacity for material expression. When that thinking ceases to be necessary, when thought has achieved a certain peace with its expression, art in its historical necessity will come to an end. Something may continue, but will have no longer have any particular reason to call it art. The aesthetics thus closes, as we mentioned last time, in dissolution. Art has, on Hegel's view, finally lost its purchase on our thought and world. It has given over to the prose of philosophy. The thought of art is part and parcel of the world's taking measure of itself, but in the end it can't be that measure, and so it sinks back into the merely measurable. It is no longer autonomous. I put things this way because it seems important to be clear from the beginning that for Hegel, the history of art is going to be periodic. It's going to be metrical. This thought is, in effect, already embedded in his account of the speculative proposition and its ongoing transformation of, of its subject. As I noted last time, the dialectic unfolded in the lectures on fine art is in the end an unhappy one. Art begins as inchoate, gathers a measure of coherence and autonomy to itself, and then returns at a higher level to its initial incoherence. The two volumes of the lectures explore this along two interrelated axes, one historical and linked to art's content, and one systematic, linked to the forms of what Hegel calls the individual arts. On the historical side, and this is where our own ideological sensitivities are most likely to be engaged, we're asked to imagine a development from symbolic through classical to romantic art. And on the formal side, we're asked to imagine a passage from the not yet art of architecture through the achieved art of sculpture to the wake of art as enacted in its dispersion across painting, poetry, and music. And that's sort of the basic shape of each of the arts, how it is a fitting together of form for a certain kind of content. 
Not all forms fit all contents. The different arts are a way of addressing that, of making sense of that. Right? Hegel fastens these two sides, the historical and formal, directly onto one another. So that what so that the symbolic, historically symbolic, is paradigmatically architecture. What is historically symbolic provides a certain type of content. It is the type of content that is best given form by architecture. Right? Um, the classical is sculpture. The content the classical casts up, and we went over this last time, the content is the gods in their plasticity, right? is the content best given its form by sculpture, and so on. The main line of arts history, then, you might say, its kind of central line of sense, runs in this diagram from upper left to lower right. right? On the upper left, we have the symbolic in its most paradigmatic architectural moment. In the center, the classical in its sculptural form and painting and other stuff. But for the moment, I'm just saying painting for the romantic. Hegel also takes it that these various dialectics continue to be active within one another. That's why the lectures are as long as they are. He's not just telling this sort of nine square story, but all the stories that are operating inside this. So the symbolic will have both its classical and its painting. The essentially architectural none will nonetheless have its moment of sculptural centering and of romantic dissolution and so on. So this little slide, which I'm not going to go over with you, but is sort of the internal dialectics of classical sculpture. It's architectural and painterly moments. It's symbolic, classical, and romantic aspects. Um, in this interlocking, one further, less explicit stake lies in the shape assumed by the arts as a whole as if the history of art were in some measure the story of its coming to recognize itself as constituting a system. So here we would say something like, in the symbolic moment, the one that is paradigmatically captured by architecture above all, the arts, the plurality of individual arts, simply amounts to a bunch of things being under the same roof. Or more accurately, we'll come to this later, it's just one damn thing after another. For the classical moment, with its sculpturing, sculptural center and sculpture being there in order to be the center of a culture, say, the plurality of the arts amounts to there being further expressions of sculpture. But it is sculpture that holds the arts in their unity. And in the romantic moment, the arts know themselves to be plural, to be dispersed, to constitute a system of some kind. At one end of history and system, we have our architecture. Um, well, I've, I've said that. So here's another version of that nine square diagram that's meant to, to further integrate that as well. Whether it does or not, I'm not so sure. A version of this point in relation to art's history um, deserves underlining. Art grasps itself as art, as having and as having had a history only in the era of its dissolution. As art history, that consciousness, either represented by a discipline or within art's own consciousness itself, is itself a romantic fact. It's also, of course, the place Hegel stands, right, just off the lower right of the corner, in making all these claims after the diagram has made itself fully visible. This is, you might say, also the moment of the museum. It's where that institution can have an object to display. And so it's hardly accidental that the thing we generally treat as the first art museum is going up just blocks away from Hegel as he's giving these lectures, right? Schinkel's Altus Museum, 
Um, and it strongly reflects in its plan the underlying logic of Hegel's system. It's a temple of art with sculpture timelessly at its center and painting displayed in explicit historicality in a sequence of galleries that surround that. Um, and of course, this is, for many, many years, the fundamental floor plan of almost every major art museum that emerges. On this account, art is the place in which the world is reworked so as to become available to philosophical discourse. The world is, of course, always available to those kinds of talk. So you might better say it is reworked so that this discourse um, can take full possession of itself, understand its own materiality. Language is both a kind of complex precondition for art and, in another sense, its outcome. Art mediates language's passage from pure arbitrariness and exteriority to its full outward articulation of itself. Um, it's thus intimately bound up, as I tried to outline last time, with whatever questions one might have about the status of Hegel's own text, its materiality, readability, and so on. The end of art in Hegel is then at least double. There is one end, classical and sculptural, that is art's end in the teleological sense, its fullest achievement, where art becomes most fully itself, um, most nearly fully autonomous, and where, in a certain sense, if it were a real subject, it would come to rest. But it's not a real subject. It's finally outraced by the world, by thought. It's made to move on by what escapes it. And the, that leads to the other end of art, its romantic dissolution, its discovery in grappling with the content, the inwardness of human being, that it can only display as, it, as necessarily beyond its means. The specificity of this moment is marked one way by the dispersion of the individual arts into a range of finite mediums in more or less our modern sense. And it is displayed within its paradigmatic arts. Our concern is specifically with painting, but Hegel includes music and poetry here as well, by their withdrawal from the sculptural claim to full expression. They give expression to an inwardness that they know they cannot fully communicate. Right? Um, they are, in this sense, all arts of finitude. They make themselves out of their limitations. The Greek god stands fully before its beholders. Jesus does not. The two dimensions of painting are the most explicit markers of what painting can no longer be, three-dimensional, fully present. Buren's painting, Surrendering even the claim to make something graspable as a painting in favor of simply an act of painting that turns itself over immediately to a play of covering and uncovering and a working of limits in and against one another, strips Hegel's account of painting of even the problematic support of human inwardness. The only support it knows is broadly architectural, as if he takes our moment to be determined by an absence of center an impossibility of sculpture that leaves art obliged to oscillate uncertainly between its architectural incipience and its painterly dissolution, balanced between beginning and end with no possibility of a settled middle. So this is almost Jurens piece for the 1971 Guggenheim Biennial. It is, one might say, a standard enough Buren, the usual striped fabric with one or more white stripes also painted white. It had one further element, a smaller banner-like piece of the same fabric with the same painting stretched across the street outside at right angles to the canvas hanging inside the museum. It's presumably an instance of institutional critique, easy enough to take as one particular enactment of the consequences of the minimalist insistence on situation that brought the gallery and the art world fully into view and into question. One might imagine the sting of Buren's critique to be more than adequately registered by the fact that the piece itself was, in the end, up for only about six hours. It was taken down against the artist's will and without his knowledge um, immediately before the opening. 
This is the kind of fate we often hope for for avant-garde art, the same kind of fate Hans Hacke's much more politically explicit work detailing the corporate entanglements of the museum's trustees met at the same institution later that year. But in this case, the outcry that led to its removal arose neither from the public nor from the museum. It was driven by a small group of artists in the exhibition, the leading minimalist, minimalist Judd and Flavin, prominent among them, indeed leading them. And their objection was, and I'll try and put it neutrally, to the altered conditions of visibility imposed by Buren on the museum and more particularly by the altered conditions of visibility imposed on their work. It was not a moment of small egos, and Buren was the brash foreign kid. Buren himself often cites this piece as definitively demonstrating through its massively shifted scale that his proposition successfully broke apart painting and the pictorial, and he often also refers to the possibilities opened up by the way in which its thinness nonetheless made itself count in the place of sculpture. He titled the work in the end Pantur Sculpture, but he doesn't ever refer to it as anything other than painting. What matters is that in some way it has taken over the place of sculpture. And here I think it's useful to pause just for a bit over the Guggenheim itself. It is in plan a variation on Schinkel's paradigmatic work. Its great peculiarity in relation to its model is to leave its center void, and it does so in order to claim the centering force and form of sculpture finally for itself, a posture strongly underlined by the spiraling interior that precludes any distinction of internal parts. So I think the first thing to see in Buren's piece, and what I think the work finally is, is an assertion of the barest facts of painting, a certain play of showing and concealing that counts at once as a discovery and transgression of limits, over and against an architecture aiming at sculptural self-enclosure. Cutting through the museum's attempt to make architecture and sculpture coincide, it refigures the central sculptural void the building means to recover for itself as a centerless space, a cut of sorts, in which art oscillates between its beginning as architecture and its end as painting, with no clear view of itself or its history. This would be the shape of the ongoingness of the contemporary over and against the closure of Hegel's romantic or modern. This is what the piece thinks, and there's no access to its critical force apart from that thinking's form as painting. It's not a ready-made, it's not a signature, and it's not a theoretical illustration. It's also not a painting. There's nothing to be said of it that way. Um, but it is painting. It has limits. It covers and uncovers. It shows. And what it shows is a particular shape of the modern instituting of art, a fact to which the museum belongs but which is not simply summed up by it. And in doing this, I think it also does something that I've been calling reading Hegel. This is a matter not just of its being a practice of painting that can be assimilated to Hegel's general understanding of painting as a finite medium, but of its pushing that practice to the point that it uncovers the terms Hegel imagines as more straightforwardly historical as caught up in a particular logic of beginning and ending that's proper to art in its ever-vanishing autonomy and which emerges only through a certain acknowledgement, another word then for the force of this intervention, um, of a defining absence that obliges art to make itself with ever greater explicitness, explicitness not within the terms of a realized system, but out of relations continuously at play within it. A further question one might ask that I will try and answer more slowly over the course of these lectures would be about what we're doing when we settle for the standard description of Buren's work, when we fail or decline or refuse to see it. What kind of mistake or failure is that? I think it takes some time to be ready to answer that one, so I'll stop here.